up again. Happy Sabbath. Okay, we are uh, going to continue in our study of the book of Daniel, chapter 7. First, we have a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, oh Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to once again to open your word for study. We pray, O oh Lord, for your Holy Spirit's presence to give us understanding from on high. Guide our thoughts, the words that are spoken this morning, may they be used to further the spreading of your gospel, O oh Lord, throughout this world, we pray. In the worthy name of Jesus Christ, we ask this prayer. Amen. 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 Okay, we're going to continue with the uh, message that I started the last time in uh, Daniel chapter 7. So if you can turn with me there, Daniel chapter 7, and we're going to first do a, uh, a quick review of some things that we covered the last time, and then we're going to look at the next great devouring beast of Daniel chapter 7. But the first thing I want to mention here today, the first thing I mentioned in the last presentation was this idea of what the, uh, the Bible speaks about called the repeat and enlarge principle. Uh, I mentioned that in the last presentation because it's a very important uh, principle to understand as we continue to study Daniel and then Revelation. Um, the repeat and enlarge principle, I try to sum it up in this picture here of this nice uh, pathway with the sun shining upon it. And you know, if you were to darken the sunshine, the pathway would get dark, right? Mm -hmm. If there were things on that pathway that we need to be aware of, without the sunlight shining on it, we wouldn't be able to see them. And so the repeat and enlarge principle is similar in that in one area of the Bible, the Lord reveals something, but it's not in, in, in the complete detail that he would like for it to be. And so then in another area of the Bible, we see what? We see more things being revealed. We see more, as you would say, sunshine. Si uh, shining on our pathway so that we can understand uh, what is being shared with us. And so that principle applies here in Daniel chapter 7. And matter of fact, because we've been comparing these beast powers that have been revealed to the uh, statue of Daniel chapter 2. And if you look back at Daniel chapter 2 and compare it to Daniel 7, I think you can clearly say that there is more information being revealed in Daniel chapter 7 than there is in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2. And so that was the first principle that I think we need to consider. The next uh, principle we need to understand is this idea of uh, erroneous interpretations of scripture that we should be uh, aware of. Matter of fact, I talked last time about different versions of the Bible and how they interpret Scripture. And when it comes to prophecy, it makes it very difficult to understand prophecy if you have different versions of the Bibles that are changing words that are, are, are mentioned in the King James and replacing those words with other things. And so then we're not able to link Scripture with Scripture. You know, Isaiah says that we should study the Bible uh, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and what? There and there a little. So if we're going to use that approach to study God's Word, then there's got to be words in one Scripture that link to words in another Scripture. Amen? Amen. So we got to have that tie. And so I went and looked at um, just one uh, phrase from a scripture in the Bible, in the King James Version, and it's found in Exodus 20, verse 10. And it says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So I looked at that scripture and compared it to some other interpretations of the Bible, 
And of those interpretations, there were uh, five or so that got the translation right. The five were God's Word translation, Jubilee Bible 2000, which I have no idea what these, these guys are. And then there were two others that got the phrase correct in their interpretations of, of the Bible. And I'm not saying go by these guys. I'm just letting you know that of the ones that were reviewed, these two got it correct, at least this part of the scripture. Well, the ones that didn't get it correct were the NIV, of course, the New Living Translation, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, Holman Christian Standard, International Standard Version, and eight more on that list that took this simple phrase from the King James Version of God's Word and turned it into something else. And sometimes those changes are very subtle. Matter of fact, these versions of the Bible mention that phrase as this. Can someone read that? But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the, of the Lord thy God. Now, read the first one there. Exodus 20? Yes. Exodus 20.10, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. What's the difference? Does anyone, is raise your hand if you recognize the difference. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? What's the difference? Amy. So, what is wrong with A replacing D? A means like many. It could be A. It could be any day. So, yeah. 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 You see, the change is subtle, isn't it? But it makes a world of a difference, does it not? Yeah. To say that the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord versus the seventh day being what? Yeah. The yeah. Sabbath of the Lord. And so I, I brought that up to, uh, to help us understand that when we study God's Word, uh, there's a reason why He gave us what we call the Protestant Bible. That this version of God's Word is the most accurate that we should use when we're trying to understand His will for our lives. Amen? Amen? That we should turn away from all of these other versions. And even though God's Word translation got this scripture right, there are other scriptures that I review that none of these guys got them right. So we should be careful if we uh, have these versions of the Bible and whether or not we t intend to use them to study God's Word. And so that uh, this idea of erroneous interpretations we must be aware of. And not just in the Bible versions, but we need to understand when we, we, we go out there on the web and we see uh, these other uh, uh, conclusions being drawn from these beast powers, uh, giving them names of other nations that had nothing to do with the subject matter today. Matter of fact, most of the nations that are mentioned in the Bible are there only because they had interaction with God's people. And so that's another uh, uh, principle we need to understand that nations are mentioned when they come in contact with God's people. If they never came in contact with God's people and they're not in prophecy, we shouldn't try to put them there because they have nothing to do with it. Okay, so now I wanted to focus on uh, reviewing some of the things that were mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, Daniel mentioned the four winds. And we talked about those four winds. We saw scriptures in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. And I'm going to read that if you want to turn over there. Revelation chapter 7 verses 1 through 3 talks about the four winds because Daniel said in Daniel chapter 7 verse 2, he says, uh, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night and behold the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And so Daniel is saying these four winds have some impact upon the great sea. And so we looked at these scriptures in Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 through 3, and you know the Bible always says in the, you know, the mouth of two or three witnesses a thing is established, so here is another witness, and it says there in Revelation 7, 1 through 3, 
And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the what? Earth. Of the earth, that they, the winds should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any trees. In verse 2 he says, And I saw another angel sending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And how would those four angels hurt the earth and the sea? By releasing the four winds. And so the word comes to those angels to hold back, in verse 3, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, until we have done what? Seal the servants of our God in their foreheads. And so Daniel, in chapter 7, verses 2, says, I saw these four winds, and they are affecting the great sea. Uh, uh, John, in Revelation, said these four winds represent um, a, a, some type of conflict, some type of strife that is going to affect the people of this world. Because he's clearly said in, in uh, Revelation 7 that they should not hurt the earth. And so if these four winds, once they are loose, are going to do uh, great uh, uh, damage to the earth and to the populations on the earth, the Lord has said it's very important that we hold them in check until my people are ready for me, until my people are ready. And so we should be praising the Lord that these four winds are mostly held in check right now. But we know, Daniel said in Daniel 7, 2, that they started to blow. And these four winds started to blow on what he called the great sea. And so we looked at another scripture in Revelation chapter 17, 15, that helped us understand what does the sea represent in prophecy. So the four winds in prophecy, we know, represent strife, turmoil, war, and destruction. And the question remains, well, what does the sea represent? Because Daniel said, I saw these winds of strife blowing on the great sea. And in Revelation chapter 17, 15, the Lord says there, and he said unto me, the waters which thy saw it, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So we clearly see from that, just that one scripture that this idea of water in prophecy represents peoples, represents nations, represents tongues, which are languages. And also in Isaiah chapter 17 and verse 12, we find there in Isaiah 17, 12, it says, Woe to the multitude of many people, which make a noise like the noise of the seas. So Isaiah said the multitude of many people will make a noise like the noise of the seas. And going on, he says, And to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty water. So John is saying people, that water represents people in multitudes. Isaiah, in Isaiah 17, 12 says people represent what? Uh, waters and rushing waters. In Psalms chapter 18 and verse 4, the Lord says there, the sorrow of death compasseth me, and, the, and David says there, and the floods of ungodly men have made me afraid. So David is liking the, 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 the group of his enemies to a flood. And when we think of flood, we think of what? We think of water. And so clearly these scriptures are letting us know that in prophecy, waters represent peoples, multitudes, nations, and inhabited areas. And Daniel said also, in Daniel 2, that these winds strove upon the great sea. And when we look at this word in the Webster's Dictionary, strove means to agitate or stir up. And so here we see these winds that are blowing, according to Daniel 2, they're causing turmoil. They're stirring people up to, to commit war and to cause destruction upon the world. Okay, And the last thing he says there in verse 3 of Daniel chapter 7, if you can turn back over there, it says, And four great beasts 
came up from the sea, diverse one from another. And so Daniel says, I see these four great beasts that come up from the sea. You know the sea represents people, multitudes, and nations. And so the question remains, well, what do the beast powers, these beasts represent in prophecy? Well, in that, chain, that same chapter, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 17, can someone read that if you have it there? Daniel chapter 7, verse 17. What does it say there about these beasts? These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. So a beast in prophecy represents what? A king. And a king is, well, can you be a king if you don't have a kingdom? No. What are you king over? So, so a beast in power represents a king and kingdom, does it not? Oh, in prophecy. Verse 23, look at verse 23 of that same chapter. In verse 23, the Bible's interpreting itself. It says there what? Can someone read that, the first part? Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth king upon the earth. Okay, he says the fourth beast shall be the what? Fourth the fourth kingdom. So we see Daniel giving us clear interpretation of what he meant in verse 3 of chapter 7 when he said the four great beasts rose up out of the sea. He's saying four great what? Kingdoms would rise up. So the Bible is letting us know, it's going to give us some clear history here, that there are four great kingdoms that have existed on this earth. And the reason why they are great is because they conquered, at one point in time, the entire earth. Amen? Okay? And interestingly, he says also that, that these, uh, these, <coughs> these beast powers represent kings and rules, and we see in Great Controversy, page 440, it says they're clearly the great kingdoms that have ruled the world. Notice that they have ruled the world were presented to the prophet Daniel as beasts of what prey, rising when the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. So this is an, an additional clarification here that our understanding of these symbols in prophecy, when we study prophecy, are correct. That these beast powers represent kingdoms, that the winds represent strife, and, and, and turmoil and war that will come upon the great sea and we know the great sea represents people's multitudes and nations and going on it said also in verse 3 that these 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 powers would be what diverse what does it mean to be diverse it means that they would be different one from another when you look at them there will be some type of difference <coughs> associated with them. And so when we look at these four beast powers, clearly they are diverse, aren't they? In verse 4 of Daniel chapter 7, we covered the first one, which was the lion that had the eagle's wings. And we talked about how that lion represented the kingdom of what? Babylon. The kingdom of Babylon. Matter of fact, in Daniel chapter 2, uh, when Daniel talked about the statue and the head of gold, he told Nebuchadnezzar, thou art that head of gold. Mm -hmm. And so this first kingdom, the lion kingdom in Daniel 7, 4, we know to be Babylon. That it was the first great devouring beast mentioned in scripture. And that that nation of Babylon ruled the entire world. Mm -hmm. Now keep in mind, when Daniel talks about these four beast powers, they must be world rulers. Okay? We, we can't claim that Russia is a beast power. Has Russia ever ruled the entire world? No. Has Germany ever ruled the entire world? Yes. The entire world? <laughs> no. So, so Hitler tried. He tried. But he was met with opposition, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And so when we think about that, it should take that other stuff and just push it right on off into the trash. Because if it wasn't a power that ruled the world, it cannot be listed here. So the Bible, and the Bible makes it clear that Babylon was the lion with the eagle's wings. And we talked about how those wings 
repre represented the swiftness by which Babylon conquered the entire world. Okay. And the second kingdom, which one was the second kingdom? Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia, which was which animal up here? Bear. The bear kingdom, wasn't it? The Bible says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 5, that the bear kingdom was Medo-Persia. As a matter of fact, if you have any doubt, you can turn over to Daniel chapter 5, verse 28. Um, and it clearly says there, if you flip over there real quick, because we're not that far away. In Daniel chapter 5, verse 28, it says, thy kingdom, it says Perez, and it says, thy kingdom, speaking of the kingdom of Babylon, that at that time was led by Belshazzar, it says, thy kingdom is divided and given to who? The Medes and the who? Persians. So the Bible says, hey, without a doubt, you don't have to guess at who this bear kingdom is. It is the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. And Daniel mentions in Daniel chapter 7, verse 5, that this, that this bear was raised up on one side. And we talked about that a little. Basically, the Lord is letting us know that this bear had one head, right? But it actually had two rulers. Because Daniel 5, 28 says the Medes and the Persians. Now, the bear doesn't have two heads because those two rulers were in unity. They worked together. They were not in opposition to each other. And so the bear kingdom is represented by this bear with the three ribs in its mouth, but its shoulders was raised on one side, meaning also that one of those rulers would be stronger than the other. And looking back at Daniel chapter 5, it goes on to say that when Darius, who was the Median leader, uh, took over Babylon, he was 62 years old. So he was an elderly gentleman at that time, and so he was much older than his nephew uh, Cyrus, who was the Persian leader uh, of, of that kingdom. And so that is why the bear was raised up on one side, because Cyrus was stronger than Darius, who was the lead and the older gentleman. And so, and also the Bible says that this bear had three ribs in his mouth. Now, if, if, if you drive down the road and you see buzzards eating an animal, a dead animal on the side of the road, by the time they get to the ribs, what have they have done? They, they consumed all the entire animal, haven't they? And so this bear, if he is walking around with ribs in his mouth, what has he done? He's devoured hasn't he? And so through history we learned that this bear kingdom that the Medes and the Persians when they rose to power they had to put down other competition and that comp competition existed in the form of Babylon, Lydia and Egypt and so that is why this bear kingdom has three ribs in its, in it, in its mouth okay and uh, it's also represented in Daniel chapter 2 as the breast and its chest of arms and silver. And we talked about last time that this bear kingdom came to its end uh, at the hands of the next kingdom, which we're gonna which we're gonna focus on today, which is this leopard uh, kingdom. This leopard with four heads. Remember what I said about the heads. If you got more than one head, when we're looking at prophecy, that lets us know that these guys were not in unity, were they? At some point in time, this leopard kingdom forms four heads. But before that, we know that it was a unified kingdom. And so if we can turn now to Daniel chapter 7 and verse 6, and we're going to look at the characteristics of this leopard-like kingdom. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 6, and it says there, and, this, and after this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it two wings. Four. How many wings? Four. 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 It had four wings on the back of it, the four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also how many heads? Four, four heads, and dominion was given it. And so here we have 
here we have these characteristics of this beast power. Uh, the Bible says it was symbolized by a leopard, which we know is a fast animal, isn't it? Yeah. But it is also an animal of prey, isn't it? Mm -hmm. it, it uh, last time I checked, it doesn't eat uh, vegetables, does it? <laughs> It's a, it's a carnivore, isn't it? Okay, there we go. And it also says that it had how many wings on its back? Four. Four. It had four wings on its back. And so if the leopard, which is a swift animal, has four wings on its back, now remember, what other beast power had wings? The lion, the lion right? Which represented Babylon, had how many wings? Two. Two, Two wings. And so Babylon conquered the earth in a record time. And so if Babylon was very swift in its conquest of the entire world, then what do you think about this power? Swifter. Yes. It's twice as fast, isn't it? Because it has two sets of wings, and it is also a leopard. Is a leopard, a, I, I, I think we can say a leopard might be a little swifter than a lion. Mm -hmm. Lions are pretty big animals. And so, so this kingdom then would, because of the wings on its back, conquer the earth in record time. And so the question must be asked then, who was the leader of this kingdom? And the Bible lets us know that in 336 BC, that this kingdom organized and set out on its conquest of the entire world. And the leader of this kingdom was called Alexander the Great. And I think we've all heard of this gentleman, hopefully, in our history classes. But one other thing I want to point out and look at some scriptures here. Uh, a lot of times we call this the kingdom of Greece. But the Bible does not call it the kingdom of Greece. If you look at these scriptures here in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 11, the Bible says that this third devouring beast kingdom in Daniel chapter 8 verse 21, it says, and the rough goat is the king of what? Grecia. It calls it Grecia mm -hmm. instead of Greece. And there's a reason for that. Uh, Daniel 10, 20. Now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of what? Grecia. Grecia shall come. And then in Daniel 11, 2, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of who? Grecia. against the realm of Grecia. And so the question must be asked then, why does the Bible use this idea of Grecia versus Greece? Well, if you look on the globe, you'll find that in, in what was considered to be the world at that time, that Greece was just a small nation. Matter of fact, it had at at that time, what the historians call city-states. You ever heard of a city-state? You know of one today? Vatican. The Vatican. The Vatican is a city-state. It's a city, but it has statehood, right? Mm -hmm. And so in Greece, in the nation of Greece, were these city, uh, uh, city-states. And so Alexander the Great came from one of those city-states named Macedonia. And I think we've heard about that. Hopefully it'll come back in a minute. And so Macedonia, led by Alexander the Great, started to conquer each of the city-states in the nation of Greece. Okay? Now keep in mind, he was taught by these Greek philosophers, uh, I think uh, Socrates, and, and so forth while he was a youth. So he was ingrained in Greek theology and Greek teachings uh, as a young man. And so when he came to power over this city-state of Macedonia, they started to conquer each of the city-states in the nation of Greece. And once he was able to do that, then he went on the road to conquer the entire world. So the Bible uses Grecia because it was sort of a combination of the nation of Greece and the city-state of Macedonia. So you have the first part of the word being a part of the word Greece and the last ending in IA 
which lets us know it's associated with Macedonia. Okay? And so the, the Grecian kingdom was the third kingdom that would rise to power, and it would be led by none other than Alexander uh, the Great. And matter of fact, when you think about it, this leopard-like uh, beast power that conquered the, earth, the world so, so swiftly uh, would also introduce the teachings of the Greek nation everywhere they went. And so remember, Alexander was taught uh, as a young man by uh, Aristotle and Socrates' teachings and such. And so everywhere they went, when they conquered, they poured in the Greek knowledge. And so they did that all throughout the world. And so that's why you can go to so many different places on the planet, and what you find? This Greek idea, this Greek philosophy, the Greek teachings that were uh, part of the life of Alexander the Great. Matter of fact, even in our politics, our Western style of politics, guess where it came from? It came from Greece. I remember when Justin was, uh, I think it was eight years old, he had to do a report on, uh, on governments. And interestingly enough, as an elementary student, they were teaching that our system of government arose out of those ancient teachings. And matter of fact, uh, when we look at the artistic theories that are used in our country today, and countries around the world, where did they come from? They came from Greece. Scientific methodologies came from Greece. Religion, even some religions, if you dig deep enough, you'll find that they have some tie back to this leopard-like kingdom of Greece. And, and uh, matter of fact, let's turn over to Acts chapter 19, which is where our scripture reading was, because even the apostles had to deal with some of these uh, erroneous teachings that were being put forth by uh, those who were accustomed to these Greek philosophies and these Greek theories. In Acts chapter 19, and uh, picking up at verse uh, 22, because remember I mentioned that, um, that Alexander the Great came out of the, the city-state of Macedonia. So in verse 22 it says there, so he sent into Macedonia two of them, this is Paul sending his uh, associates, uh, them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia, meaning that Paul stayed in Asia. But look at verse 23, and it says, in the same time there arose no small stir about that way. Why were they stirred up? Because here comes these men teaching Jesus Christ to a people who were accustomed in Greece to hearing about Diana and all of these other Greek goddesses. In verse 24, which was our scripture reading, for a certain man named Demetrius a silversmith, which made silver shrines for who? Diana. Diana brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. So what were they doing? They were profiting off of this, quote, likeness of Diana that they said fell from the sky. And so they started making all of these crafts. And people were buying these things up because they were worshiping Diana. And where did Diana come from? A Greek goddess. And where did that come from? These teachings that were brought forth by who? Alexander the Great. This, this, you know, this, these errors were being perpetuated all around the world. And here they are in Greece, the home of it, and they see it clearly here in Acts chapter 19. And you can read the rest of that on your time. As a matter of fact, there's another scripture you can take a look at in Acts chapter 17. As a matter of fact, that was an encounter. We're not going to turn there, but that was an encounter in Athens, Greece where once again, uh, the disciples of Christ, the apostles, are met with opposition to Jesus Christ in the form of these people teaching and, and, and worshiping these erroneous gods. And so that is where this idea of Greek mythology and philosophy came from. It came from Alexander the Great and the fact that he was able to conquer the world at record time and as a result of that, introduce 
this, uh, these teachings that he had. And this map sort of gives you an idea. Over here, over here on the left, you see Macedonia. Now that is where Alexander arose from. Now when he became strong enough with enough uh, support and army, he started this trek of conquering the entire world. And he would go from nation to nation. Uh, matter of fact, in 331 BC, we know that he brought down the Bear Kingdom of Medo-Persia. And he fought Persia here in Arbella and, and, and was able to overthrow. But you see, he ventured down into Africa and overthrew Egypt. And so the Bible says in, uh, I think it's 2 Kings, that Egypt would never come out of its boundaries again. So he overthrew Egypt. He came over Abella, Arbella, overthrew Medo-Persia, or Persia at that time. He continued on up into the northern uh, area here where he overthrew Turkestan and, and all of the stands that we hear mentioned in history today. And uh, continuing on, he went over to even into India. And he conquered the northern part of India. And by the time he got here, his men said, look, God, we want to go home. And you know, I did a, I did a Google map uh, uh, direction uh, for a route to get from Macedonia all the way over to India, 4,000 miles. But that was a straight shot. So you can imagine on foot and on horseback or whatever they were on, that they took this route here and went around and conquered all of these territories. And according to the Bible, he did it in half the time it took for Babylon to do it. And so that is why, I guess, they coined him Alexander the Great, because he was able to overthrow the world in record time. And so... Uh, going on, and I uh, want to look at one more thing here. Going on, uh, the scripture says that this leopard had four heads. And so the question must be asked, well, how did we get to this point where the kingdom shifted from that being led by Alexander the Great to that being led by this, these four heads or these four generals that replaced him? Well, uh, we're told from the historical account that Alexander the Great and his uh, men were what you could call strong partiers. You know, they did not miss an opportunity to take a drink. And uh, the historical account lets us know that often Alexander would murder his friends and associates during a drunken raid. Uh, you know, one time it was, it was, it was stated that 20 of his men died as a result of excessive consumption of alcohol. You know, we've talked about the diet, right? We talked about the wine that the Bible mentions and the grape juice and the difference between the two. They were not consuming grape juice. They were consuming alcohol. And it would get the best of them to the point where almost on most of the occasions people would die as a result of it. As a matter of fact, in 323 B.C., uh, after going from party to party, he was called in to a party, according to the historical record, where you know, he thought, well, because Hercules was, quote, his god, he wanted to do everything Hercules did. And so at that point in time, it was thought that Hercules drank from this cup uh, uh, twice. And this cup was what we would call six quarts of our liquid. Mm -hmm. So you know what a quart container looks like. You know, the, if you get a quart container of milk or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, can you imagine drinking six of those? Uh -huh. And not only six, but he drank 12. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, it wasn't over five or six hours. He's, he sat there and he downed 12 quarts of alcohol in one setting. And uh, needless to say, not too long after that, he's on his deathbed. And he died uh, not uh, putting in place a will and testament like we talked about this morning, 
that would turn the kingdom over to a, a successor. And so with the kingdom not having a true successor, what do you think happened? Well, there's inward fighting between his generals to determine, well, who was going to be the replacement for Alexander the Great. And as a result of that, his kingdom splintered into four pieces. It's interesting, the Bible says this leopard kingdom had four heads. And history accounts to the fact that after his death in 323 BC, that his kingdom resulted in four parts being led by these four generals, uh, Ptolemy, Cassander, Lysimachus, and Seleucus. Those were the four generals that replaced Alexander the Great and took over his, his kingdom. Mm -hmm. Neither one of them by themselves had the power to rise in strength and replace him, not because they couldn't, because the Bible said they would. Mm -hmm. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 5, it says clearly, and I mean verse 6, it says clearly the beast had four heads. And we know that that head represents that, that leader of that kingdom. And so Alexander the Great's kingdom was replaced by these four generals. And these are the areas that they actually controlled. You had Ptolemy that controlled Egypt. Seleucus controlled what we call Iraq, Syria uh, today. And we have Lysimachus that was in control of most of Turkey and what we call Asia Minor. And then we had Cassander who was in control of what was Greece and Macedonia at that time. And so neither one of them could actually overthrow the other initially to uh, gain complete control of the entire world. Because the Bible said that they would not rule the world uh, as, as one. And so that brings me to the close in revealing who this third devouring beast power was, and it was the kingdom of Grecia, uh, led by Alexander the Great. And we're told in history that it came to an end in 168 BC at the hands of the next devouring beast. And it's interesting, I'm not going to go into that beast power uh, because it, as the Bible says in verse 7, that it was dreadful and terrible. Now, it's interesting that it doesn't use an existing animal from the animal kingdom to describe this next peace problem. He says it's dreadful and terrible. And you know, if you remember the first image that I put up there, we could clearly see what the first three looked like, right? Lion, bear, leopard. But that fourth one, did it look like any kind of animal you've seen walking around today? No, because there were some things about that beast power that would be so dreadful, so terrible in what it would do that the Lord said, I can't even think of an animal on earth to describe. Mm -hmm. And so we're going we're gonna to learn more about that in the next presentation. And so I want to finish with this, um, with this uh, quote here from the book Education. And uh, it says there, it is these great truths that old and young need to learn. We need to study the working out of God's purpose in history. Get there here because I'm sure that's going to go out on me. We need to study the working out of God's purpose in the history of nations and in the revelation of things to come. That we may estimate at their true value things seen and things unseen. That we may learn what is the true aim of life that viewing the things of time in the light of eternity, we may put them in their truest and put them to their truest and noblest use, thus learning here the principles of his kingdom and becoming its subjects and citizens. We may be prepared at his coming to enter with him into its possession. The Lord is showing us who these, these powers are and when they were reigned, so that we can be prepared to receive him when his kingdom 
is set up. Amen? Amen. So that we can be a part of his kingdom to come. And so hopefully we've gotten a better understanding of who these powers are, why they existed, and what kingdom it is to come. You know, Christ's kingdom is soon to come. In Daniel 2, Daniel said, I saw a stone, a mountain that was cut out, a stone that was cut out of a mountain without man's hand. And he said it struck that image at the feet. And we know that to be Christ's kingdom that is soon to come. And the question that must be asked today, are we, are we willing, are we able, are we desiring to be a part of Christ's kingdom? If you can't, if you do, if you want to be a part, please stand with me. Jesus, we can say to you. Notice by our heads for one quick. Our Father, we thank you, O Lord, for this blessed Sabbath day and for this word that you've shared with us today. We pray, O Lord, that as we understand the things that are seen and as you reveal to us the things that are unseen, that we will take these things, O Lord, use them to prepare for your soon coming. But not only prepare ourselves, O Lord, but also to reach others for your kingdom. Father, as we dismiss from this place, abide with us throughout the remainder of the Sabbath day and the week to come. Hear our prayer we ask in the worthy name of Jesus Christ. Amen.